So, Mazar Khia, um, I would like to thank the organizers and particularly the organizing uh, people like uh, Dr. Sahi Hawass and Dr. Mustafa Waziri, Dr. Hisham El Laiti, to invite me to give this uh, talk today. It's a great uh, pleasure and a great honor for me to be here and to present some of the collaborative work we have done in the last uh, few years. And a lot has been said already in the uh, past uh, few minutes, but I would like to highlight a few more uh, specialized uh, points. And I would also like to talk a little bit about what could be done in the future to actually get more more insight on this uh, person who lies behind the gold mask, um, um, Tutankhamun. So I would like to uh, split my presentation in three parts. First, a very general introduction, then talk a little bit about the known facts and uh, later on about the own unknown um, parts. Um, but I would like to use this opportunity to uh, show thankfulness and gratitude to be able to perform this work because I was here a few years ago already, as you can see, and even before that in, in Cairo in the 1980s, and I've never thought that I would be able to be invited here, and I would like to thank um, the ancient Egyptians for allowing us to examine them in a certain way, but also obviously the modern Egyptians to allow us uh, to do these uh, investigations. We uh, started in uh, Switzerland uh, looking at mummies for quite a while. We have uh, done about we have about 25 years of experience in uh, mummy projects, particularly um, in projects uh, in Egypt. And uh, I think the most important thing is that you have uh, an idea about the variety of different types of mummies, and uh, we will see that, particularly in the case of King Tut, that actually has implications because every mummy is different, and you have to be aware of this uh, variation. And you also, I think, to have a, a proper investigation of mummies and to have a proper understanding of uh, what mummified tissue looks like, you need to do experimental work. We have done in the past some work on uh, fresh human cadaveric material, but also on animal material. Uh, but you also need to um, investigate a, a particular um, person or a particular mummy from various angles using different methods. And we are particularly focusing in our group in the past uh, on imaging methodology, including uh, portable X-ray and uh, portable uh, computer tomography. So um, I would like to now focus on the CT examination, which has been uh, led by uh, Dr. Havas and, and colleagues uh, since 2005 as part of the Egyptian uh, Mummy Project. And um, as we have already heard before, I think it's fascinating um, if we step back a little bit to see how CT imaging actually reveals a different perspective on this personality. We have the golden king, we have the mummy, but we also have the virtual mummy. And I think each perspective is different. And as um, Salim Ikram so nicely said, you know, it's not science against humanities, it's both together because science actually offers a lot of possibilities, but to actually have the final understanding, I think we need both um, perspectives uh, to work together. The general assessment, we already heard about that. I think overall, and I have seen a few mummies in my life so far, it's not a very well-preserved mummy. They're obviously much better preserved mummies. So the soft tissue in total is uh, badly preserved, and part of it, or the vast majority, I think, can be attributed to the work um, done uh, in the 1920s without blaming them in any form. It was a different time period. But we also have heard about these severe uh, extremities, that there are a lot of cuts. The ribcage are now mostly missing. I don't think they have been missing that much at the beginning, in the 1920s, when they were examined. And we have multiple breaks of bones. And I remember the first time when I uh, was invited in 2005 to have a look at the CT scan, that it, it was fascinating to see so many breaks on a, on a body, you know, there were so many cracks in the skin, so many breaks on the bones, and obviously most of them um, uh, can be attributed to the work by um, um, uh, Howard Carter and, and Derry. But on the other hand, we don't have a massive pathology. We don't have a huge tumor, for example, or a major disability, which is striking if you just look at the mummy from the very um, superficial uh, perspective. But if you dive in deeper, you actually see that there are some um, lesions, and some of them, are, um, or actually most of them, have already been addressed. So it's a medical assessment of an approximately 19-year-old um, uh, person, and not being an Egyptologist, I don't know exactly what the Egyptologists ex expect from me to give an answer, so I'm giving you a, an age range which would be from 18 to 21. So this is basically the range which we all agreed on when we looked at the CT images 
based on the fusion of the epiphyseal plates. But one has to take into consideration that all these aging charts are based on modern growth patterns. And we obviously don't have enough material, we just discussed that today over lunch, that we should have actually cases, ancient Egyptian juveniles, who actually, where we know exactly how old they were, um, to have like some kind of a reference. But we obviously don't have that. So we can only use modern data, and that's why I think we should give a certain range, which in this case would be 18 to 21. Um, slender, the, the, the tallness we already have, and also the fact that, you know, the death was not related to these bone pieces, which uh, Dr. Archer of Selim uh, showed nicely. But obviously, we have various bone fractures. And we also have to take into consideration when we talk about the cause of death, for example, that a lot of um, material is missing. We have basically no internal organs, you know. That doesn't allow us to, give a full, uh, to have a full picture of the preservation of the body. Um, we have heard about the things. I also uh, think from a, um, uh, from a mummification perspective, and that had been mentioned in the, in the previous talks as well, it's still quite a unique mummy in a sense that it's a combination of having a lot of packing material, but at the same time we also have quite different um, embalming liquids, different density of liquids, and interestingly um, uh, we, we, we see at various body parts different um, uh, types of mummification um, embalming liquids being applied. And uh, I think we could probably, and th this is one of the propositions for future examination, we probably could even do more CT imaging of mummification uh, um, material and mummification um, um, fluids, for example, embalming fluids, so we have a reference on what that, that means on a radiological basis. Um, the head, we have uh, heard about that. Uh, it was uh, mentioned uh, in, in the past that it could have been a clippal file syndrome. This is not the case. The main body, as it presents, uh, presented in the, in the CT scans, clearly shows this enormous uh, packing, also the different uh, densities again, um, the packing here, obviously the, the cut at the third uh, lumbar vertebra, the slight scoliosis as well. Um, so you see the body actually has been massively changed uh, uh, due to the mummification, and based on such a, you know, um, as assemblage of mm, tissue material, it's really difficult to actually come up with a clear definition for a cause of death. Um, we obviously, um, in uh, 2007, the first time in, 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 in another paper led by Dr. Hawass in 2010, um, it was postulated that it's, uh, the cause of death is this uh, fracture, or potential cause of death is this fracture in the left knee area. Here you have the precise uh, medical terminology of this um, fracture, which is a so-called uh, 33C3 fracture, which is a defined fracture in the Arbeitsgemeinschaft für Osteosynthese, which is the leading orthopedic uh, uh, international society classifying fracture. So it's a, it's a kind of fracture which is well known nowadays. Again, that doesn't prove anything, but it's just um, the fact that it's well known. And then, obviously, also, um, as uh, Saha Salim also mentioned, uh, this curler's disease, it's morbus curler type 2. Um, in the left foot, malaria uh, was uh, shown uh, molecular by uh, proving uh, by plasmodium falciparum in this paper by Hawass et al. in 2010. And I think, again, it shows how multiple factors may actually have contributed to his death. And it's difficult to say which one has which priority or which degree of importance. I think we could go over each um, image for hours probably to discuss details, but it's interesting to see that we have a presentation of uh, changes uh, which s look similar to what you expect in modern um, uh, um, day uh, cases uh, of, of medical um, diagnosis. The problem is that with all of this, and I think uh, Saha already mentioned that as, as well, um, with a lot of these radiological findings, these are only radiological findings. So what does it really mean from a functional perspective? Um, in, in medicine, uh, um, you al always have to see that, you know, Diagnosing is one thing. The other thing is what does it mean in the daily life? And I think we have to be very careful, and also uh, Salima mentioned that, what kind of um, label we give to this person just based on the radiological images. So that's why I'm still very cautious about the cause of death. I can't, even from my personal um, uh, perspective, I don't want to give you a clear answer on the cause of death, because first of all, again, we are lacking quite a lot of material, and I will talk about that in a, in a minute. And secondly, even if we have a certain condition, doesn't mean 
we don't know exactly what the functionality would have been. So, and even in modern medicine, you have to be very careful on that. So where do we stand? And again, it has been uh, mentioned before, we, uh, together with Salima, uh, we, uh, I wrote this uh, small uh, paper on kind of the evidence-based diagnosis on King Tot. And on one hand, I think he could be very happy because he uh, draws a lot of attention. On the other hand, I think he's probably the person who has uh, the most diagnosis attributed to him in the world um, because basically everybody has a different diagnosis. And it's quite difficult for non-medical people to see what what is the level of evidence for these different diagnoses? I'm not telling which ones are correct and which ones are wrong. I can't do that. But I can just say certain are more likely and certain are less likely. But even the unlikely things can actually happen. So we have to be very careful of giving values to these different theories. Um, some of them actually have a, a true basis based on, for example, radiological data. Others are purely speculative. And we have to take that into consideration. So, that brings me already uh, to sort of the, the final, but maybe the major part is um, where should we go on from here? And I would like to start with uh, some little bit of ethical considerations. We have published one or two papers on uh, ethics and, and mummy investigations, and I think this is an important issue, particular uh, for King Tut, because I think the way he was presented in the and dealt with, dealt with in the 1920s is something which we never would do again nowadays. Again, I'm not blaming anybody from past societies and past times because you know we never know what people will say about us in 100 years from now. Um, but I think it's just to be aware that we have to be very careful when we deal with an individual. It's still an individual, the way we present this, and this comes down to the fact, you know, what kind of methodology should we use? How should we present the individual? What kind of labels do we give an individual? Do we give values to it? As a medical doctor, I'm used not to give values to anything. Even if I find a diagnosis, even if it's, I don't know, a psychiatric diagnosis or something, you shouldn't give value to it. You just mention what you actually see and don't um, put any um, subjective parameter to it. Because harming someone can be not only on a physical harm, when we have seen that happen a lot to King Tut, but also uh, a sort of a, a harm to the personal identity. And uh, you clearly see that, you know, the, the physical status in 1926 was not very good, and basically all different uh, extremities, uh, different uh, body parts have been cut, and uh, in the pictures you don't really uh, see it, but uh, um, when you do the cats, can you clearly can sh see that. And also, since uh, 1925 and 1926, when was reburied, um, there was a lot of damage um, happening to the mummy, whether this is just by the fact that the storage was not adequate or because the mummy has been taken out of the uh, tomb several times, um, uh, needs to be discussed. Based on our experience, we usually recommend to rescan, for example, mummies like every 20 to 30, 25 years because the technology gets better. But in cases where you have a very fragile body, like for example King Tut, I probably would be very careful on doing that. So I'm not saying we should rescan the mummy. I think this is for the moment okay, especially since the data from 2005 are very nice from a technical perspective. But there are still a few research avenues or roads I think uh, we could uh, go. First of all, I think we often tend, and I blame myself as well, we often tend to have these fancy tools and want to use the latest technology and the latest machines, but sometimes, and particularly also again in medicine, it's very important to actually look at the patient, you know, that even happens nowadays. <laughs> we, should, we should look at the patient, we should look at the mummy from a macroscopic perspective, and we probably can see, for example, different colorization, we can see thickness of material, we can see the surface texture. If it's on a very subtle level, some of these issues you can't really see on a CAT scan, particularly if it's on the, on the surface, obviously. So that may help to solve some of the um, ongoing uh, debates on um, uh, surface alterations. The second part are the internal organs. We had had a study in the last few years focusing on uh, canopic jars, and we, we just published a paper on getting some ancient DNA out of um, canopic jars a few weeks ago. Um, and we focus on the canopic jars in general because I think they're often neglected a bit, um, but they are con containing obviously internal organs. And in the case of King Tut, I don't expect uh, something outstanding, but still it would be nice to have a proper medical assessment of these internal organs. I know they are not all of them. The heart, for example, we are not expecting there. But at least we could have a, a, a better understanding of some 
of the, of the um, um, preservation of uh, these organs. The molecular studies, I think uh, yeah, Professor Yehia Gard will talk about that in a minute, um, they offer possibilities not only about kinship, but potentially also about um, the, the, the proof of certain um, pathogens. We are expanding now the field of ancient DNA from bacteria even to, to virus uh, infections. So I think in the future uh, uh, we expect uh, some more uh, information from this angle as well. And then, um, Zaha already uh, mentioned that, we have more human rem remains in the KV-62, which are um, important to link to the mummy. And that brings me probably to the most important thing. We actually have quite a lot of samples, and this is just a list of material which has been found in the West Valley, in the, in the main uh, Biban and Moluk, but also in the, in the Valley of the Queens, um, you know, various places where we actually have quite a lot of human remains to, of uh, different preservation status. Some are more skeletonized, some are more um, mummified. From the 18th, from the 19th dynasty, which actually help us to understand and put Taught into perspective because if you look at just one single individual and you're not looking at the whole population, you're not looking at the, the, at the whole um, uh, environment, you are actually are not doing a, a good job because you really put, have to put that into perspective to see the variation. So I think doing more comprehensive, multidisciplinary humanities science um, based um, studies on this comparative sample could actually help to answer some of the questions as well. That brings me to the final point, is the importance of the examination. I don't think I have to tell you how important King Tut is, but even beyond the field of Egyptology, even in the medical field, um, I more and more um, experience that people come up and say, you know, it's in not only interesting what you're doing, but also it really has a medical benefit. Because if you think about the fact that we are, need to know more about emerging diseases, for example, in human history, the mummies are the best archive to do so. I think it's really um, is important to do proper scientific studies, minimal invasive studies, ethically correct studies on mummies to uh, proceed here. And this is also have been shown, for example, in Nature Medicine and other leading medical journals. And we, we just uh, are working on a, on a study where we try to collect different uh, samples to, to actually get some kind of paleoepidemiological data. You know, the more we actually have data from mummies from the past, we can actually have a better picture, not based on single cases, but actually do some kind of paleoepidemiology. And I think that's the lead uh, and the future of uh, this kind of work. I would like to finish by thanking all the different people I met since 1989 uh, in, in Egypt. It's, it's a great uh, privilege and a great um, honor, and I always feel a bit like a dwarf standing on shoulders of giants. And uh, I would like to thank you for the uh, attention. Thanks.